what does a beautiful future look like to you? You can flip a negative mood on its head. This was a talk that was all over the place, but then New York, you are all over the place. There are experiences that you just don't get anywhere else. Thank you for joining us for the 92nd Street Wise event for CBS's The United States of Al with executive producers Chuck Lorre, Maria Ferrari, Dave Gesh, Ray Reza Aslan, Maya Tuzi, and the cast. The United States of Al premieres on Thursday, April 1st at 8.30 on CBS. Here is a spot for the series. There he is, there he is. Al, ah, over here! Ah! Oh. I want to see everything. Washington DC, Las Vegas, and what's the name of that place that sells peanut butter and brings it to you on a forklift? Costco. The whole time I served in Afghanistan, Al was my interpreter. Hey, welcome! Let me get you a beer. Dad, no alcohol. Right, oh, sorry, sorry. No, your son should be sorry for talking to you with that tone of voice. I like him. Daddy! Do you know that your Uncle Al is your godfather? Which some might say is even more important than an actual father. Mm, no one says that. How could you not tell me you were having marriage problems? I could have fixed it. From Afghanistan? It's not the moon. We have Wi-Fi. I appreciate how much you want to help, but he couldn't make it work. Do you think you tried hard enough? He's the one who didn't try hard enough. He was probably exhausted from war. There was a lot of walking. Thank you for keeping my brother safe. As your godfather, I will protect you for the rest of my life. Will you be my godfather, too? Get your own. Thank you for welcoming me into your home. Yo, what's happening? You'll get used to it. United States of Al premieres after Young Sheldon, Thursday, April 1st, on CBS. This is who everyone wants to jump on at first. Where did this idea come from? How did it all begin? Well, a few years ago, uh, Marie and I started talking about uh, this show and it grew out of reading so much about a real situation. The, there is a SIV program for a uh, special immigrant visa program that allows translators from Iraq and Afghanistan who served alongside US forces to come to America. Um, and not as many have been able to come as have been promised. but but some have, and there is an incredible bond between many of these translators and their military, the Marines and um, military service people they serve next to. And, and we just felt like that would be a great start for a show. What a, what a connection of friendship between two people to build a world around and a show around. Maria, how many do you think are in the United States, some of these, these translators who are immigrated over here? Oh, I don't have that number. I know that there are 17,000 still waiting in Afghanistan, and that is probably a low number. Um, I'm not sure how many have actually been successful in their applications. I know that there have been periods where it has been sort of ground to a halt altogether. Did you feel a need to reach out to some who are actually here to? Yes. To, if I did. Yes, we did interview um, many translators um, as we were starting to talk about this show. Um, and we're continuing to interview them and bring them back and have them speak to our writing staff. And um, we're actually going to have one translator who's been a great friend of the show who lives with his friend who was a Marine uh, who served with him are going to come visit next week. So that's going to be exciting. We're going to meet them in person instead of over Zoom. Mm. Chuck, they're right. This, 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 this is a great German of idea that can make uh, a great show. Why was the decision to go with a multicam? Why not kind of what you do with Young Sheldon since you're dealing with very sensitive matters in that show, maybe not have the pressure of 
the, you know, the laughs, that sort of thing. We definitely talked about going uh, single camera film style, uh, but, uh, and I was kind of, uh, I was, I was interested in going that path, but I was overruled by Maria. <laughs> it's true. I, I wanted to do the multi-camera format. I love it. We had just spent a decade doing it on Big Bang. And, you know, Chuck was already doing uh, Mom, which is already dealing with very serious issues. And that's how MASH was done. And I just felt like it was an appropriate format. It's the format that I had the most affection for. So that one is on me. <laughs> <laughs> Grace and Mayad, when did you join the, the writer's room? From the very beginning? Well, Dave and I have been friends for a really long time and we'd always wanted to work together and we never really had an opportunity. So when he came to us with this idea that was percolating, we jumped at the opportunity. We've always been very focused on telling these kinds of stories and and the dream for us has always been precisely to get uh, a sort of a, a Muslim protagonist on network television, someone who could really um, reframe the perceptions that so many Americans have uh, about Muslims or people from this broad uh, region. And we knew that Dave and Maria would be the perfect shepherds for this and that Chuck would be the, the kind of person who would be able to take what could be some very heavy topics, war, displacement, immigration, xenophobia, and transform them into um, something entertaining and palatable, but without necessarily taking the edge away. So we were very excited to, um, to join this team and, and make this show a reality. It's, it's really, it's the challenge. Um, the challenge was also real intriguing, like to do something multi-format network sitcom situation comedy that takes on these kinds of an issue and brings together people who would never, you would never see together on screen. You know, this is a very, you know, what's, what's interesting about conflict and I spent a lot of time working in conflict zones is that it, it forces scenarios and situations that you would otherwise never see. Uh, the two characters who are the center of this show would never meet likely in real life, would never be together, much less forge the kind of friendship that this these characters' stories are based on, those sort of types of lifelong friendships that you would rarely see. Would, most of us would never really sort of form those kinds of bonds, but it's very common in conflict and instability. And so what's interesting about this show is that it allows us to take something that comes from an unfortunate situation, which is conflict, but to really show what, you know, it's like a flower that grows through the, the concrete, right? The, it, it's absolutely beautiful to watch and challenging to, to, to actually show it and really sort of honor it in a way that has never been done before on network television. And that was a real great challenge for us. And as Reza said, sort of a real mission, you know, not just, you know, there has been um, Muslims and, and Afghans on network television, just not normal ones if you would, just regular people who you can associate with and talk to and want to, and the people we know, the people who are family members and neighbors and friends, et cetera. And so that was really important. Um, so in what setting did these two meet? Explain for the folks how they met, how they worked together. You're muted, Dave. <laughs> Man, after a year, you'd think I'd get this. Um, <laughs> after a, a crucial part of the, pretty much every military operation the US has ever done is to work with translators. And of course in Vietnam, that was the situation. Um, and in Iraq and Afghanistan, thousands and thousands of people uh, were hired to be translators and work uh, side by side. And so in our story, um, Al, uh, who is a an Afghan born translator starts working with Riley um, in the Helmand province uh, during the surge around 2011, kind of in the backstory. And, um, and then he applies um, to come through this program, but it takes years to, to actually get it and cut through all the red tape. And Riley plays an instrumental role um, in, in helping Al get here. Chuck, what did you think when they came to you and said, we want to make this into a sitcom? What was your initial reaction? Can you recall? Yeah, actually I can. Um, 
I was really excited about what was explained to me as as Awalamir Al is a, is a fixer. Um, his role uh, with the U.S. forces in Afghanistan was to not only translate but to make introductions, to to uh, to to facilitate what needs to be done, not on a combat level, but in terms of working with, with people in, in, in the environment. And, uh, and that when he comes to America, he's still playing the same role. In the pilot, there's, you know, he, he's intent on fixing his buddy's marriage, which is broken. Uh, he's, he's, uh, his nature doesn't change, even though his environment changes dramatically. He's still, that kind of uh, extraordinary human being who whose main motivation is to make life better for the people around him and uh, and I, I was struck by that as a great character to build around that character who who sees uh, human conflict as an opportunity for him to provide a service to 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 ease the discomfort to 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 translate between people who misunderstand each other um, uh, because of language or because of uh, their own failure to communicate. So uh, that's a very long-winded answer in saying I was very excited from the moment I heard this, that mm. this would make a wonderful buddy comedy, but also it's a fish out of water story. It's a man trying to acclimate. Both he and Riley, the Marine, are still acclimating to civilian life. And, and it's a family story because uh, uh, Riley's family is, is very much becomes a surrogate family for Al. And, uh, I don't mean to project my own fears, but embarking on this seems very intimidating because of, I mean, the subject matter itself, you know there's gonna be questions about who you cast, the type of jokes that you play. Did you have that come to Jesus discussion in Chuck's room at one point? <laughs> you know, we we had that come to Jesus discussion that we've, we've never stopped having it. That was the first in every discussion that we have about this show. Um, and it has informed everything we've done and every choice we've made. And all I can say is we've, we've built the show very intentionally. You know, we brought Reza and Mayad on early um, before the pilot was written because we knew that we would need uh, to have what we wrote reflected back at us um, through a different lens. And we built our writer's room to provide us with people that had the lived experience that we would need to do this. And um, we read a lot of books, you know, we did a lot of research, but, but you know, I understand sort of the enormity of, <clears throat> of what you're talking about because there, it, it is a very ambitious project and there are a lot of pitfalls. Reza, Maya, tell me, tell me what it's been like so far when you, you first sat down with them. How much did you change? How much did you go, whoa, 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 whoa? What, what, what's it been like? Well, it's been a great partnership and we haven't really had to, we haven't had to be those guys, you know, like no, 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 shame, shame, shame guys, because, you know, Dave and Maria are so responsible as storytellers and it's been a very collaborative process. But more than anything else, you know, what we've tried to do is um, take this notion of representation, which we take very, very seriously as Iranian Americans who have been, you know, misrepresented on TV all of our lives um, and to address it by filling the room with Afghan writers um, who can speak from a very personal place. Um, who, you know, a lot of the, the uncomfortable jokes, a lot of the uncomfortable situations um, that we represent on screen are literally taken, sometimes verbatim, from the experience of the Afghan writers in the room or their families or their loved ones. And so that's how we maintained authenticity. And so it keeps us from having to constantly come in as like, you know, <laughs> as, the, the, as the cops and, and say, you can't do this, you can't do that. That hasn't really been our experience at all, really. Look, I think that there, one of the things that I learned really early in this uh, sort of in, in the story of, tele, in, in the storytelling business and in, in, in motion pictures was that the second you, um, you are forced to look at the thing that you've created, whether it's a, let's say a cut of a film or the thing that you've written is being read by someone else who comes from a different perspective. You yourself do a lot of correcting, right? And so I think a lot of times what happens is that Reza and I's presence from the beginning is one in which knowing that we're going to be reading something, 
really makes everyone think differently, right? And, and, and it happens for all of us. You know, I used to have a little uh, monkey that I used to put in front of my computer screen when I was editing back in the day, just so I can re replicate what it would feel like to look at something in a big screen, right? So, so that the eye that is present um, is, you know, that's why representation matters. And that's why it was really important that this room was filled with people who had not only, who are generating the stories as Reza was talking about of, of, of this character, but whose mere presence essentially becomes something that everyone thinks about, who's writing, who may not have those experiences because now you know someone is sitting next to you. And I think also that's why this show is important because we need to see the country that we live in reflected on the, in the stories that we tell about ourselves. And, and, this, and, and here is a show at this level that tells a story that's happening every day. It may not be happening in this ideal way, right? I think it's really important to, to note that most of the, the Afghans who are coming through in the SIV program, almost, almost all of them, with the exception of very few, are having a very difficult time. They're not, they don't have the loving family that Al is coming to. There are some who do and we've spoken with, but I think the idea is how do we use this in order to shed light on a part of American life and American, what's happening in our own communities that we don't normally get to see. And seeing that, knowing that these people exist, knowing what they have done, their service and how um, intricate they are as part of who we are and what we believe in, um, really will hopefully change the way we all think about uh, the people who are our neighbors and our members of our community that we need to think about and support. Maya, you said you were in conflict before. Yes. What does that mean exactly? I did, well, I grew up in conflict. I grew up in Iran during the revolution and the war, but I went, uh, when I, right after I finished uh, school, film school, I literally went, went to Sierra Leone and then I was in Ivory, you know, Ivory Coast and Burundi and Sudan. I was in Afghanistan during the invasion for six months. Then I went into Iraq, rode a donkey into Iraq, in fact, the third week of the war. Uh, that's a story uh, in and of itself. So I spent a lot of time um, sort of taking what I'd learned and trying to apply it to how we think about conflict and how we measure its, its, uh, its value, right? You know, like a lot of times we, we think about conflict from, from perspective of how many innocent people died, um, where if you think about the, 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 the toll of conflict from the perspective of how many people are, remain, how many who are alive, then you suddenly realize that it's way too expensive. And sometimes maybe it's not worth fighting. Uh, when you think about the impact it has on those who remain, you know? So that was a big part of it. And I spent a good amount of time doing documentary work with NGOs and small organizations. And then a good amount of time being the videographer for many of the public clips you all saw over the years um, that came from those places. Um, okay. yeah. All right, you had just said that, um, uh, uh, some of these translators, they have a very hard time assimilating. In the sitcom, Al, it, Al, it seems like it's very easy for him. He he feels very comfortable in this household, it seems like. He's very commanding already of, of everybody in the room. Did, was that of a, a specific design? You decided not to go to show how difficult it is for him? Well, no. When we say that other translators have a difficult time, I think we mean that they are not um, supported very effectively when they get here that sometimes it will be you know a meeting with a social worker and they drop off a check for a couple hundred dollars and they kind of leave them in a ramada you know so mm -hmm. al is in a fairly privileged position in that he has a family that is willing to welcome and appreciate him and take him in and we didn't mean by that 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 is the the norm for uh translators but maybe more that that is the ideal that this family is stepping up and sort of providing the support structure that one would hope we would provide as a society collectively, except that we are not currently doing that. Um, and, you know, we would like to, in the future, be able to use that to cast a relief on, you know, the struggles that other interpreters face or the, the feelings that Al might have about, you know, getting this support structure that other people don't get. Um, yeah, does that, does that answer your question? <laughs> It does, it does. Have, do you have ground rules in the writer's room like Al won't ever be the butt of jokes? I mean, I say that because what if viewers, I'm gonna put myself out there like me, feel bad about laughing, don't wanna feel bad about laughing about a joke that, that you know, riffs off a stereotype. Yeah, we are trying to take a do no harm approach to our 
joke telling. And that is generally not the kind of joke that we enjoy anyway, or things that are making fun of people. I don't think that that's anybody's sensibility in this room. Um, and, you know, sometimes there is disagreement and we can get very like Vox podcast weedy on, you know, how we feel about different things. But, um, but yes, we, the jokes come out of the situations and out of people's divergent points of view. And that is where the show really sings. And these characters love each other, but they also can tease each other. They are in the way that family members do. And particularly in our conversations with vets and how they deal with each other through humor and especially those who are bonded so much uh, through, from their experience. Um, Chuck once said that these characters, they're never not gonna live next to each other. They're never not gonna, these people are always gonna be together and be their friends, which allows them to say things that other people might not say to each other, allows them to, to maybe make fun of each other in ways they wouldn't be able to, but, but not in a way that's meant to be at the expense of the, or into a stereotype. Yeah, the, the characters have the right to make fun of each other, but the show does not have the right to make fun of them. Raisa? I have no memory of saying that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it's in our large book of Chuckisms. Um, <laughs> well, I was just going to add book, that. And that's a pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to add that. Um, if you know anything about Afghans, uh, you know that they have a sardonic and macabre sense of humor. Um, I mean, if you can imagine, you know, these are people who have lived through decades and decades of conflict and war going, you know, beyond uh, the 80s. And so uh, oftentimes, you know, some of those jokes, especially, you know, that, that when they come from the Afghans in the room might rankle other people and think, oh, that, that seems uncomfortable. Um, but it is important to note that uh, a lot of the, the jokes that um, Al makes on the show come from that kind of sensitivity, right? That, that sort of ethos where it's like, you, you know, you're, you just have to be able to laugh at yourself and to make fun of the situation that you're in. It's almost like a survival mechanism, really. You know that about Afghans, but we don't. So what if we feel bad about, I mean, it makes us uncomfortable. Well, that's kind of what I was saying is that that's, that's the, the beauty of a, a Chuck Lorre production is that we don't have to constantly police ourselves, that sometimes we can make a joke that will make someone feel uncomfortable. Sometimes we can have very long, uncomfortable pauses, you know, where we don't always have to immediately break the tension of the show by, by with a joke. We can just let something land for a while and let the audience really think about it. And, and in the end, that's the experience that we want the audience to have. You know, we don't, uh, this is about entertainment. There's no question about it. And it's a very funny, very appealing and entertaining show, but let's not, lose sight of the fact that what we are, the background for the show, the context for the show um, is, is trauma and heartbreak and loss. And so we're not gonna shy away from those things, even if we end up making a joke about it anyway. Look, it's that, I think it's really important to, to point out that what, what has been accomplished and what, what Dave, Maria and the writers uh, have been able to do over the course of this season is actually to do something that is uh, you know, you, I think when when we talk about things like like feeling uncomfortable at a joke, we're associating it to the way we're used to seeing things and we're, the way we're used to seeing people made fun of on television. Uh, this is not that kind of a thing. What you know, when those jokes come from an authentic place, even though you may not hear the Afghan writer in the room pitch it you will feel it on screen and you will know that it feels different. It won't feel uncomfortable in the way that you would think feels uncomfortable. It may uh, feel uncomfortable in that it pushes your, your perspective on Afghans and the way they maybe joke about things and, and their sensibility, et cetera. But that's exactly the point. It should, we should make people feel uncomfortable because, what they, what, because their perceptions weren't entirely accurate or they're only based on a very specific and narrow point of view of this culture. Uh, but what you will get in the course of this season is, in fact, a very, a very, A, it'll be familiar, it'll feel authentic, and, and, and these jokes you'll find, as many jokes, many places are, are universal. There's, you know, there's a great Talk of the Town piece on, 
one of our writers, Habib Zohori, who is actually re it's a really great way to think about how even comedy works in this room because he's a really funny guy. Um, but, you know, half the jokes that he tells, uh, you know, like the dirty joke, I, I love that dirty joke. Like that's a dirty joke I've heard many times in different languages. You know, a joke is a joke. And if it's funny, it works. And if it's coming from an authentic place, it won't feel uncomfortable and awkward. Hmm. Reza, I know that we've obviously already seen some knee jerk reactions from folks just, you know, going off on the trailer and you engaged with some of those folks via Twitter. Um, I have two questions. First, dude, why? Why'd you do it? <laughs> As my daughter would say, bruh. <laughs> and two, what, what was your, uh, what was going through your mind? Was it, were you, was it anger? Was it, I can't, how could you, or what were you thinking? What were you thinking? No, no, not at all. Look, we we get it. I mean, we understand. You know, as as brown people in in this country, we know better than most. Um, you know, the sensitivity that a lot of people have about the way that Hollywood has represented them. Um, so it's it's not anger at all. Um, it's not even defensiveness. It's it's a attempt to say that we hear what you're you're we're saying. We understand your fear. What you don't understand is that we have bent over backwards trying to do something about it. And that this show that you're judging on a 30 second trailer um, is actually the antidote to a lot of the, the fears and the, the hesitations that you have. Um, we are doing it right. Um, in fact, I would say that what we've created in this show, particularly you have this writer's room that is almost half vets and half Afghans um, is revolutionary. Um, we, we truly believe that the United States of Al is not just a, a fantastic, great, uh, hilarious, wonderful, emotional show. We think it's the model for how Hollywood can make shows from now on moving forward. You know, when, uh, you know, when someone writes the, the story of this era of Hollywood, we think we're going to be our own chapter. So we're not ashamed or embarrassed or defensive in the slightest for what we've done. On the contrary, we are incredibly proud and we just want people to give it a chance before they judge, but we understand why their first immediate reaction is defensiveness because you know we, we feel that way too sometimes when we watch um, the way that Hollywood has portrayed us. So I understand you met with members of the Afghan community last week. Who, who was at that meeting and what did you talk about? We, we, so we, we met uh, the first, we had a little mini meeting with members of the Afghan community before we even shot a frame of the pilot because one of the things that's really important with the Afghan community is respect. And you've got to have the respect to let them know what you're doing. And, and this has been the motto of what Reza and I work for 16 years. You know, we've, uh, we've worked with projects uh, that deal that trade in the identities of of communities across this region, and and it has always been both our recommendation and our modus operandi to make sure that we sit and listen and discuss and converse with them. Um, and so we did it initially in September before we shot the pilot, and then we had for weeks planned to do a bigger one where we could screen a couple of episodes, one from the beginning of the season, one mid season, so that they can get a sense of how a, a, sh a show will move and uh, um, in the course of a season and then, and then open it up so that we can listen, right? It's really important to create an opportunity to listen and to hear them and to allow them to hear each other um, and to answer any questions and concerns that they have. We had, uh, we were all on um, as well as our writers, specifically the Afghan writers and, and as well as a couple of representatives from uh, the really amazing organization, No One Left Behind, who supports uh, uh, Afghan and Iraqi interpreters uh, who are trying to get over here on the SIV program and, and, and the ones who have come to settle and resettle, et cetera. Um, and uh, it was great. It was a great conversation. It was a, um, I would say, overwhelmingly positive. And people were, there was a, I think, I, I would say that the, it was a breath of relief. After that weekend, people were very concerned and terrified, that rightly so. And then they were like, Oof, okay, exhale. It's okay. It's not what we thought it was. Um, and, uh, and you know, is, 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 does the show, when you have one show and one character on television that deals in your identity, the expectations are high. 
right? You want that one character to embody every part of the thing that's been missing. And I think a lot of times, even what you could say about what this reaction on Twitter was last weekend, and generally the expectation of the community, it reflects really more on the problem that exists, right? The power of entertainment media on underrepresented communities in this country, and the trauma that we've all felt over, you know, decades. Um, That's what you see in these reactions and in these desires for these characters to be perfect and to reflect everything that you want them to reflect. Obviously, no one show can do that. Uh, but we're, we're, we are doing it in this form in a great way. If representation matters, then we're here representing. The writers in our room are representing. Um, and, and this is the kind of dynamic in a relationship where you, could, you, you have meaningful representation, right? We're not just window dressing. And that's what the writers told their community. Trust us. We're not here um, just to look good and to check a tick a box we're here we're generating every single storyline of this character they're coming from our own lives and the lives of our family members trust us to see this through in a way that you'd be proud and and we are proud and i think everybody else will be in the once you know in the course of the season as we take these characters through this amazing journey that they're going to go through and beyond hopefully how long did it take to find your al it took a long time it took a lot of actors yeah, we, um, yeah, we looked at hundreds of people around the world. Um, so many, and using Boom Gen's outreach uh, with Resin Mayad and casting directors from all around. Um, and uh, yeah, we saw we saw those <laughs> we saw that scene many times from many actors. <laughs> yeah. And how and and how was that? I mean, you ultimately you went with a very talented man who's South African. Was there a lot of discussion like now? Will we be under the microscope because we we cast a South African man? I think of course. Of course. I was I was I was very much I, I have I have lived my entire career by by having a, a few simple rules. One of which is hire the best actor. Hire the best actor. Um, um, don't don't you know? And by best actor, the one with the best ability to. Uh, to make you laugh, make you concerned, and care for them. Um, if you don't hire the best actor, nothing else matters. The show will fail. Yeah. The show will fail, and all this discussion is 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 meaningless. Um, I, I, I'm proud to say that I I fought and won. Uh, CBS refused to let me hire John Cryer for two and a half men. You know, I, I believed in my heart he was the right guy, and he was. Same thing with, with Melissa McCarthy. It was just, that was, a, that was not a, an, an easy process, but she was, rem- she's, she has proven to be a comic genius and, 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 and a, one of our great actors. And, uh, and the same thing when Ed here came in and, and read, and everything is done by Zoom. I mean, we, we've been, we I haven't seen these people in the flesh in several years. Um, <laughs> it was so clear that he was a remarkable, remarkable, uh, gifted but trained actor. His 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 timing and his and his 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 comic intuition is uh, unparalleled. I, 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 it was a joy, and when you, somebody like that comes in and auditions, and you see that level of excellence, you're. You, you have to put aside everything else and go, well, if the comedy doesn't work, if you don't care for these characters, then nothing else again matters. The show's gonna get canceled. Um, and, uh, and, and he is, uh, he was a gift as far as I was concerned in terms of uh, the kind of talent to embody this character and to, and to and draw us in, make us care and root for his welfare. You had to be sweet too, right? He, there's a sweetness and a gentleness to it here that comes through, and uh, a joyfulness um, that uh, that that comes through his character that's in him, the the man, the and uh, and that's a very rare thing. And uh, um, I, I was I was uh, just I was just dumbstruck at how genuinely wonderful he was with every word. <laughs> Every word out of his mouth was a joy, and uh, you know, 
that's, you know, I always believe that uh, before the jokes, you have to care about the characters. Even if you dislike the character, if the character is meant to be a toxic character, you still on some level care about them. Uh, you want to see them. You want to see what happens to them. You wonder what's going to happen to them in relationships. Um, and, uh, and if that's not there, then all the jokes in the world can't save the show. So A uh, few more questions before I go on to the cast members. Did you have difficulty with the uh, title? Because as you know, there have been a few other United States of fill in the blank shows like United States of Terra, United States of Leland, of course, my favorite. United States of Aliens. Um, did you go back and forth on what to go with on the show? I've never heard of any of those. <laughs> IMDb, dude, it's right there. IMDb. I don't, I don't get out much, so I, uh, <laughs> I'm not familiar with any of those titles. Sorry. <laughs> Maria, was did you toss around a lot of ideas, or you, was this one from the start? We talked. No, we tossed around a bunch of ideas, um, but this one seemed the best. I was familiar with the United States of Terra, but not the United States of uh, Aliens. <laughs> but um, it's been a while since that show and it felt right for us. Also now, what I really love about the title is that so much of this show is about seeing America through Al's eyes, right? And the, the distance sometimes that exists between what America strives to be and what it actually is. And so the, the title just kind of perfectly encapsulates that. Now, in the pilot, um, Al goes O'Reilly when he's in the in the um, grocery store. And I was just curious, was that an O'Reilly joke from the O'Reilly Auto Parts? Oh, O'Reilly, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, but that's an excellent deep pull. Wow. wow. <laughs> this, is an, this is an excellent example of how- <laughs> So bad how much TV I watch. Yeah. It's just <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing amazing example of how the, the show can mean different things for different people based on their <laughs> perspectives. Exactly. So yeah, please don't include this in the panel. <laughs> 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 all right, that's all I'm going to ask. Uh, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. <laughs> Hey, so how long after you were cast did you find out that, hey, you will be taping in front of a studio audience after all? <laughs> I mean, I think that the different timelines for each of us, I think for me, it was uh, about two months afterwards, uh, maybe about a month before we were supposed to tape, right guys? Is when we found yeah. out we were, we were shutting down? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I had found out yeah, about three months before our original scheduled time to film. And then we got shut down about two weeks before that and then had to wait, what, another 10 months, guys? I feel like we were at about a year mark by the time we started actually filming. And since that was mid-pandemic, I think we all kind of knew the chances of a audience being in studio was very, very, very slim. <laughs> uh. Athera, you must have been really bummed by that. This is your first um, multicam, right? Uh, no, this is is not my first uh, foray into the multicam space. Uh, I was on a television show called Rules of Engagement That's that sweet. ran for several years in CBS. And um, that was a multicam sitcom that was in front of a, an audience. And then subsequent, subsequent to that, I think over the past several years, uh, the, the pilots that I was fortunate to be a part of, um, they were also all multicams in front of a, a, a studio audience. So um, it's a format that uh, I have a great affinity for and uh, I've always enjoyed doing. And, and I think it's partly because my first sort of introduction to, to acting was in the theater in South Africa. Um, and so I still feel like performing in front of a, a live studio audience holds a little bit of that, even though you are in fact performing for um, in front of a camera as well. Um, so I was very, very excited to, to be a part of, of this show. And uh, I think we all are, it's just the loveliest group of people I could have imagined working with day in, day out. Um, and in a way, even though perhaps we all had initially thought this was going to be in front of a live studio audience, it's enabled us to really sort of really 
bind together as a, as a unit to, to spend so much time together day in, day out on set. Uh, and I think our lives at this point really revolve from like our family, uh, families at home and, our, and the family that we've created on, on set. So I think that's really sort of enabled us to help shape these characters, establish, establish these relationships and, and um, become a fairly tight unit in such a short period of time. So Parker, what well, is to be it? Fair, it, it, it? Go ahead. Oh, it, no, no, Dean, please. I was just saying, to be fair, it seemed like it was the first time in front of us at Comfort there, but. <laughs> <laughs> Doom jokes take a while to fucking go through. So. <laughs> Parker, what's a bit, does the crew just laugh really loud to help you out? How has it been? <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, they do. They do. We have an incredible crew. Uh, I was I was probably one of the few of us that was that was grateful that we didn't have a live audience. Uh, <laughs> I spent about a year and a half worrying uh, about that audience. Um, I think particularly because you know I knew a deer was really going to struggle. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, it, it was uh, this show. This show, you know, is. Um, it's it's a it's a it's it can be a little bit challenging. I mean, similar to a lot of Chuck shows, in that in that we deal with some pretty some pretty heavy uh, subject matters, and I just I just didn't know how we were going to be able to do you know do some of those do justice to some of these moments in front of an audience when we were trying to like play to the audience. And uh, so I think it really served us well, you know, being able to take our time and 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 really find the really ground a lot of these moments without having to worry about an audience uh and then you know maybe season two if we if we if we should be so lucky once we've got this thing figured out it'll be nice to bring an audience in and get some laughs but until then man we've got some incredible laughers our producers our crew they uh <laughs> I, I hope that they're laughing because they truly enjoy the show but we've got some <laughs> everybody laughers on our set Dean, he definitely touched upon it the the subject matter and how heavy it is when you read the script did you have the reaction like, wait, is this a sitcom? Uh, well, no, because I obviously knew it was a sitcom. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know, I think that was the, my favorite part about it, to be quite honest with you. And it was, uh, it was a sitcom that had an amazing amount of, A, of heart to it, but also a really important subject. I mean, not only the interpreter aspect, which is incredibly important, but just the whole immigrant aspect of it and the PTSD uh, with Parker's character aspect of it, all of that stuff. And Lizzie's, you know, everybody's got these problems and they were really, you know, none of them seem like a comedy, which makes it a great comedy. And I think that that all of that is what gave uh, the, the project, uh, I think, and then we'll continue to give it a lot of depth, you know? So, you know, you don't want to be doing dick jokes in, uh, in, uh, in a sitcom, you know, you want it to mean something. And uh, this one really does, you know. <laughs> Who says a dick joke can't mean something? I mean, <laughs> well, certain nice certain dick jokes can, but. <laughs> <laughs> but there, the 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 producer said it took a while to find you. Where um, what what do you recall of the audition process? Um, I uh, I feel like I read, I think I read the script for the first time, maybe the first week of October, 2019. And then, so around the second week of October, 2019, I, I had a meet and read with uh, Mr. Laurie, one of our producers, Mayard Tusi, and then um, uh, Maria Ferrari and Dave Getch. And so sort of had gone in um, and they gave, they gave me a couple of scenes to, to sort of read and, and had given me almost like a little informational packet before I'd gone in. Uh, to help familiarize myself with sort of the Afghan interpreter experience, uh, especially those who had sort of fought alongside um, uh, U.S. forces, and uh, gave me some 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 literature and some some viewing material. So, I kind of had a day or two with that before going in, and then after that, you know, I, I was sort of under the impression, based on what I'd heard through through my representatives, that they were going to continue to look at at audition tapes and. Um, and uh, sort of see other submissions. And then I think it was around the second week of November of 2019 that um, we received the call that they 
uh, were open to me being a part of this project, which was obviously very, very exciting. Yeah. How, um, uh, what was the process like f literally finding your voice, how to sound like an interpreter who just comes to the States for the first time? <clears throat> what kind of discussions did you have with the writer? So I, I think it's, it's been sort of part and parcel of, of my experience, uh, certainly since I've left South Africa, to play characters who are from uh, different or neighboring ethnic backgrounds. Um, and so that experience unto itself wasn't necessarily new to me. But what was new with this particular project is that the responsibility of finding the character's voice was not mine to find on my own. I feel like that responsibility to find the character's voice was truly shared. And I think perhaps they, they touched on this already, but to be surrounded by you know, three Afghan writers in the writer's room, a writer's assistant who's Afghan, family members who are being portrayed on the show by Afghan actors, um, you know, all of whom are so incredibly talented and, and you know, have been able to sort of lend their own voices and experiences uh, to this process really, gave me great comfort and confidence because we hand in hand were able to create the character's voice and his personality and sort of see how his cultural identity seeped into the person that that he he is as far as sort of the actual dialect work i, I had the great uh, fortune of working and continue to work with the great dialect coach liz himmelstein mm -hmm. and um what she in effect did was met with our producers um, who then gave her sound samples of actual Afghan interpreters or Afghans who had settled in, in the West. And we kind of used them as a template to create the sound of the character. Uh, so there was very much a framework in place by the time we got around to, to the pilot. And, um, and she you know, was very kind to, to be able to continue to work with me so we can you know, maintain a, a really consistent sound. Because I think what we wanted was someone like Al who comes from a very specific part of Afghanistan who then works with US forces. And so his accumulation of like American jargon and turns of phrase are rooted in a very American experience. And so how do we create a very specific sound that um, not only honors where he's from, but uh, also the, the manner in which he's gone about um, learning English. The writers say that Al very much has a a fixer type of personality. And uh -huh. so he brings that to the States. Does everyone in this family have got some heavy shit to deal with? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 Does everyone I, have issues? Not <laughs> Art. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody except for Art. Everybody else is fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, Liz, let's start with your character. I mean, she's an alcoholic. <laughs> she, well, there you go. <laughs> Need I say more? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she's she's lost her fiance in the war, um, who who served alongside of her brother and and Al, and um, I think the character of Lizzie is dealing with a lot of grief, and through that character, um, the writers are showing a lot of facets of how grief can manifest in someone's life, and one of them absolutely is that self medication. Um, Riley's character also hits the bottle pretty hard, I will say, as does, as does Art. Um, this is a family of drinkers. Um, but then also, you know, she's, she's moved back home with her dad and she's um, put kind of a pause on her life for a little while. She's not really, um, you know, pursuing ambitions that she, she was in her prior life with Michael and kind of figuring out what life looks, at, looks like without her fiance and without that person um, who she's lost. So I, I do think that we are certainly delving into those stories as it relates to veterans, families, and this incredible hole that, that opens up when you, when you lose someone in such a, such a terrible, violent way. Yeah. And if I, if I might sort of tack something on to, to the end of that, I mean, I think as we get to know these characters through the the first episodes of, of the show, we, we sort of really come to see that the show is really about the people who have either come away from the war or come home from that war, and in turn about the impact that the wars had 
on those families and individuals. So here we have Art, who now has two kids who've been impacted in very different ways by the war. We've got the Vanessa character who has had to, you know, be a wife with a husband away to war and, and the challenges that, um, and the strains that that put on their relationship, but a daughter who has had to sort of grow up in effect without her father for a large span of her life. Um, and we sort of see how that's, that sort of shaped the person that she is. And then of course, you know, we have Riley who has had perhaps the most immediate um, experience with war and is returning and is readjusting to civilian life. And, and he and Al in turn are sort of helping each other navigate what, what that means for them in, in Columbus. So yeah, I, I think it, it is interesting to, to have, as, as Dean sort of alluded to, such a layered script where each character from the, from the, out, uh, from the offset is, is so incredibly well-defined each of whom are sort of dealing with their own challenges, but somehow because of the relationships that are formed, they're all really helping each other, um, sometimes in, in subtle ways and, and other times in, in, in more direct ways. Parker, I, I thought it was cool that Riley admits in the pilot that he misses being in, con in combat, but is, is that also avoidance too, to not, so he doesn't have to really go back to being a dad, a husband, or, or is he just, he just, he definitely misses that life. No, I think he definitely misses that life. Uh, I don't think it's avoidance at all. I think he loves being a father. Um, I think he loved being a husband. Um, he just isn't the same man now since he's been back. And, and he's, he's lost a, a great deal of um, identity, a, a great sense of purpose. Uh, there was a very clear mission. Like, I'm going to go and help this group of people. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, do what is asked of me. I'm going to take care of my men. There's, there's, there's this real sense of purpose and identity, uh, and 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 a, and a service to a mission larger than self. And all of that is immediately ripped from him, and uh, and he's left directionless. Um, you know, like what what does he do now? Sell Nokia phones. You know, he like doesn't he doesn't feel like anything is really worth doing and. And he also feels a little bit guilty because there are still men overseas, uh, Al's relatives, people that, that we promised that we would take care of and, and, and help them make it to the States. And we've essentially abandoned them. We've essentially abandoned these men who served alongside uh, our troops. And knowing that they're, that they're over there uh, is, is something that uh, is impossible to ignore. Uh, and so there's, there's a great deal of, of guilt uh, and, and helplessness. So I think he just wants to kind of finish the mission. He wants to, he wants to make good on his promise to bring these men back. I mean, he was able to bring Al back, uh, uh, thankfully, but there, there are literally thousands more. And their um, lives at risk, aren't they? Their lives? The interpreters? Are their lives at, at risk? The interpreters? Oh my gosh, there? yeah. I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, they, are, they are literally hiding for for their lives, running for their lives. Uh, if, they, if they're found, they're executed in, in the most horrible ways imaginable. And the lives of their families are at risk too. Yeah. You know, not just, not just their own lives. And so, you know, even in the story, though Riley and, and Riley's family have been this driving force to get the government to follow through on its promise to Al, now that Al's here, there's still that element of danger that Al's family could be vulnerable, um, even though Al himself is under this sort of perceived guise of, of safety. And, and Paco, you and I have had so many conversations, you know, since we were both cast and you know, we talked about like the sort of like mission and that sense of community that is that unique brotherhood and the sense of identity you find um, in, in, that, in that mission. And you have so many friends too down in San Diego who you've sort of been able to witness like firsthand once they've been able to return from war who've kind of dealt with these things real time that your character is going through in the first few episodes and will obviously continue to go through in, in the show. Yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah. Strangely enough, I have a, a lot of my best friends are, are in the SEAL, the, the, the SEAL community. Um, uh, and more specifically, I mean, some of my buddies are still are still serving in the SEAL teams, but the majority of them have recently uh, recently gotten out of the teams and are are literally in the process of trying to transition into civilian life and figure out what life looks like now. 
Uh, some of them are in school. Some of them are trying to try their hand at various professions. Uh, but for none of them has it been an easy, seamless process. Um, for some, it's been much more difficult than others. And, uh, and uh, so I feel, I feel an incredible responsibility and, and, and I, I'm so honored to get to shine a light on this story, the story that these guys go through. Uh, these men who devoted their lives to the country and then they get out of the, they get out of the service. They're no longer in the special operations community. And they, it's, it's just not particularly easy transition for a lot of them. Um, so, uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I speak to these guys every day. I spoke to one of my buddies this morning and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been really fun to get to, uh, draw from their experiences and also share with them what we're doing. And, and I know that they're so fired up to see it. Are all those guys going to give you a hard time because your shirt's off in the pilot episode? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, dude, uh, you didn't waste any time. <laughs> they, they probably are. And they're going to probably say I'm not, I'm not as built as they are either. They're going to take my ass back in the gym. <laughs> Kelly, your character is obviously married to uh, uh, Riley. Uh, how does she feel about him? Does she, does she still like him? I think that that she's dealing with a lot as is Riley. Um, she does, that she loves this guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's trying to take his shirt off. He's right. trying to convince her, uh-huh. Um, no, I, I think that she's in a, in a point of transition, transition um, just as Riley is. She is longing for that life that they had together, this person, this connection she had with basically her childhood sweetheart, this person that she's known her whole life, but then has also had to deal with him being gone. With, aside from the fact of everything he went through, she was kind of left at home. She knew that was part of the deal, but I don't think you ever quite understand the difficulty of that um, beforehand, as opposed to going through it or afterwards. She, um, she'll always have love for him. That's a father of her child. But I think having to kind of navigate um, this idea of when he comes back, it's, it's all going to be great again. Like now we'll be a family. Now we'll all be together. And the reality of the situation is when someone comes back from war and being in that situation, nothing's the same. Um, it doesn't mean families can't continue after that, but there's going to be a lot to work through. Person has seen things that you'll never understand. You were left at home to experience life without them. Uh, even if you can talk all the time, it's just not the same as having someone back in your life. And I think there's also a little bit of navigation that I'm sure she went through of, I was kind of independent and now you're coming back and I kind of don't know how to deal with having to rely on you again, which I think plays into a lot of Riley's issues is when he was away, he was needed and depended on and by his men and everything. And then he comes home and his wife, who he was probably planning on coming home and kind of taking care of and being the lead in, She's kind of learned how to live life without him. Um, I don't think that there was any love lost. I think they're just trying to figure out if they can really do life together now that they've kind of grown into two separate people who I think still love each other and they still have this main goal of raising their child in the best possible way. But I think they're still figuring out exactly what that is. I'm honestly, I'm honestly fair, sick to my stomach uh, about this. I, I want to see you guys together so badly. I'm just, I've got a sinking feeling in my stomach right now after you just said all that. <laughs> Personally, I, I was just saying, to be fair, her new boyfriend, Freddie's a lot better looking. Uh, just, <laughs> he is. He's, he's actually much taller. You and look charming. so tiny. So he tiny does. in front of him, Parker. And great and hair. He's much and he's much yeah, great hair. hair. Unbelievable hair. Tall, dark, he, handsome. His funny. beard is much fuller than yours, not <laughs> as spotty as yours is. <laughs> When do you see him take his shirt off? Ooh. Oh, yeah. no. that's more of a season. That's more of a season finale type of reveal. But you know what I mean? Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. true. Wow. Dean is the wow. patriarch of the family here. Are you kind of a fixer in your own right as well? I mean, I think he try. I think he. Well, I think he's he's forced to be that. I think you know, as as a dad would do for his kids. You know, oh, and he has two, um, obviously, uh, kids who are in trouble. And he's trying to be there for them the best he can. So I, I, I guess he tries to fix what he can. 
but uh, I think he understands that they have to kind of find their own way at it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's already been some scrutiny on this show. I, I have to imagine you guys expected it somewhat, given the the, the subject matter. Uh, Athir, do you feel uh, no pressure, but do you feel pressure? Um, I think I think if if you're sort of hinting at what I you know at, at sort of the the dialogue that's perhaps unfolded on social media and, and in the press of the last couple of weeks. I think it, I would be remiss if I, if I said that even during the audition process that there wasn't an element of uh, concern, you know, that I knew going into this that I was potentially audition, I was auditioning for and could potentially end up playing if it worked out. Um, an Afghan character when I myself am I'm not Afghan. And I understand the sort of legitimacy of what people have said because I know what it feels like when my culture has been misrepresented or presented in a stereotypical way. It was one of those, it was, it was one of the main reasons why I left South Africa actually to try and pursue a career abroad because I felt like in South Africa there I was only sort of being exposed to and, and offered what I deemed as being stereotypical portrayals of what a South African Indian is. And my sort of, that, that sort of in turn inspired me to want to move abroad so that I could, you know, portray characters who were fully realized people and not simply stock characters uh, for where the character themselves were, were the source of the humor. And so because of that, you know, as, as I've sort of alluded to, I've had to play characters of, of different uh, neighboring backgrounds. And, you know, I look at the opportunity to play the, the character of Al as a, as a privilege. And I'm committed to portraying him with even more authenticity and more authenticity and dedication than I perhaps would, than I perhaps would a character of my own background. Um, because I know how important it is to really make a concerted effort to portray this character as accurately um, as possible, because it's important for every single person who's a part of this production to get it right. And I take great comfort in the fact that I've been guided by uh, not only Dave and Maria, who unto themselves did countless of hours of interviews with um, US vets and Afghan interpreters to help kind of really create uh, a true sense of what the Afghan interpreter experience was like. But in addition to have the Afghan writers and staff be able to help guide me through whether it's learning Pashto or Dari phrases or ensuring that my portrayal of like prayers are as accurate as they possibly can be. I mean, even to the point where I'm on FaceTime with one of our writers, Habib Zahori, who's teaching me how to eat certain Afghan dishes in a way that someone who grew up in the area that Al would, um, would eat them. And it's it's sort of as I uh, again hinted at, given me such comfort and confidence in this process to know that we are endeavoring to sort of portray this character and this world um, as accurately as, as we possibly can. And, and there's one story that sort of stuck out to me, especially against the backdrop of everything we've we've sort of read about and seen in, in, in the press in the last couple of weeks. Um, one of the actors who plays um, my mom, the actress who plays my mom in the show, her name is Zarmina, and she lives in on the East Coast. She lives in Virginia. And we were in the middle of the pandemic. She wasn't able to fly. So she jumped into a car with her husband and drove across country in the <clears throat> middle of a pandemic because for her to see Afghan characters and Afghan culture represented in this way was so important to her that she felt that she had to make that cross-country trip to be a part of this project because she felt like this was truly reflective of how she views her people and how she wishes for her people to be seen. Mm. I, I, I think that the conversation on uh, certainly on social media was interesting in that uh, on the one hand, the, you know, the writers are correct. This is fertile ground. This is a great story. This is a great place mm -hmm. to start a story. Uh, I think there's just been question uh, or at least dialogue about um, does it work for a sitcom? Because you're obviously there are a lot of, there's a lot of heavy stuff here. Mm -hmm. and, and I just discussed this with the writers too. Some of the jokes are funny, but am I going to feel bad? I don't want to laugh at Al. You know, I don't, I don't want to see Al be the butt of jokes. I don't want to laugh at, at his predicament, but 
then like Razor was saying, um, Afghans have such a sardonic sense of humor, they go to that dark place. And I'll, certainly I'll, in terms, so please go ahead, Dean. I would say, I don't know that you laugh at him as much as you laugh with him. I mean, he's, he's kind of the smartest guy in the room most of the time, kind of lending a view of, of uh, a perspective of an outsider into the American culture and the way Americans deal with things. And his, his perspective is most often, uh, you know, it's funny because he's right. We're the, we're the funny, we're the kind of the butts of the joke more often than not, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And it's his kind of looking at, at our culture from an outside person that I think is much, m many of the jokes, right? Wouldn't you say? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I certainly yeah, feel like the butt of the joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Most the of the time. Joke. When you say Kabul and you and, and you met Cabo, oof. That's <laughs> love it there. I love that. Joke. Love it there. <laughs> <laughs> love it there. Yeah, I, I think that's sort of it's a different look on 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 what someone from Afghanistan is, is truly like. I mean, I think in terms of the television and film portrayals of Afghan culture, they are often tied into these very very narrow minded views of what what people believe Afghan people to be like, you know, are they, you know, it, whether it's in the, within the framework of, of, of war or, or, or something negative. Um, there's a, there's an Afghan actor who's been working in, in Hollywood for a, for a long time. And um, he just said something that he's just happy that there's an Afghan character in a comedy who's been portrayed in a positive light, who's not a villain. And I think because we haven't seen sort of, as you mentioned, the, the somewhat sardonic side of, of um, sort of that's fairly typical to an Afghan sense of humor, we also haven't seen maybe the kindness and the sort of gentle nature and sort of the loving and communal nature of that culture. And I think because even though we're dealing with serious issues, this is also a family show and we get to see our sense of family driving forth you know, what he believes to be important in the home. And we also get a real sense of what a family this is that he's walking into. So many Afghan interpreters and, and you know, Park has actually hopped on Zoom calls and had these direct conversations with Afghan interpreters as, we, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, they arrived in the United States and they have nothing, they have a suitcase and that's it. Whereas Al is coming to the United States with a brother mm -hmm. in Riley who has a family who has a home and he enters an entire world that's so loving and supportive that I think that really does make for a great situational comedy in the truest sense of what that phrase means. And I think sitcoms have maybe went through a period where they devolved into just joke telling. And they think that, you know, we're in a phase now where we have an opportunity to deal with subject matter. And that line between things which are somewhat tragic and hilarious is a very, very fine one. And I think that like Mr. Laurie has cultivated this, you know, incredible ease with which he's able to, to straddle that line. And, and this show I think is, is sort of the embodiment of that. That is the perfect quote to end this on. Thank you so much for your time. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. having us. Thank right. you guys. Okay, bye.